So uh, I'm the head of the Data Center Computing Research Group in, in BSC. Uh, so uh, the plan for the talk is to discuss a little bit over the next uh, 45 minutes about what are, from my point of view, the challenges that uh, big data is posing today. Okay. Uh, first disclaimer is even if I work in a supercomputing center, my real background is not HPC by itself. So I think a little, a little bit uh, an outlier in BSC for a couple of years. Uh, but big data is something we've been working in my in my team for almost six, seven years now. So we started uh, more, even more. So uh, the first thing to discuss is a little bit uh, try to focus where the challenge for big data is for many applications. So big data is 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 a uh, is a password. So everybody knows that. So uh, this is a. Uh, this is, has gained a lot of momentum, and this is uh, it has a lot of hype. But basically, uh, there are as many potential users of the word big data as you can imagine. Okay, so Google has one that is clear. When you have very many petabytes of data, and scientific computing, many applications require petabytes of data. But then many people is using uh, big, data, big data techniques for things that are quite smaller than that. But some of the challenges are basically the same. So uh, I, I want to start with uh, trying to focus, uh, as I said, the, the domain in which I'll be talking. And uh, given that we are BSC and we are hosting some, some large data sets, I want to I wanna put an example. This is an example I made up. So this is not really a real, real workload we are running, but I think that that's uh, putting uh, uh, the focus on the right components of the system. So as BSC, we are hosting the, the EGA. Okay, so uh, when one, one of the mirrors of EGA, so by the time I was collecting this information for the slide, when it was announced, it was around one petabyte of data. EGA stands for uh, uh, European Genomic uh, Phenomic Archive. So basically, it's a, a European scale uh, repository of genomic data. So uh, we were basically talking about around one petabyte of data. So I will take that number as a, as a reference. Again, this is a made up example. So, uh, just imagine you have one single hard disk that has one petabyte capacity, and this has uh, the standard interfaces. So let's assume that in a couple of years, people that is doing uh, hard disk uh, rotational uh, magnetic hard, uh, hard disk drive, they manage to put one petabyte of data, and you get, uh, let's say, an average rate, uh, read rate of uh, 100 megabytes per second. So in that situation, just going through that petabyte of data, not doing anything useful for it, just reading the petabyte, the petabyte of data would take 125 days. Okay. So that's, that's what you would do with that uh, uh, synthetic disk that I created, but uh, we are a supercomputing center. So let's imagine what, what we could do if we want to do a scan of the data looking for something in one hour. Okay? And that's, that's, that's when the challenge starts uh, coming up. So this is, this is the current uh, architecture of uh, Marie Nostrum 3, more or less. There are some upgrades since uh, I collected the information for this slide. But this is basically the, the general architecture of uh, the third generation of Marie Nostrum we have here. So we have storage racks, we have the storage network, we have the uh, compute network, that is the InfiniBand network, we have the compute nodes, and then we have the petabyte of data. Okay, so just imagine the petabyte of data is sitting down there in the, in the file systems. And we have those links. So this is an amazing 20, uh, 20 links of 10 gigabits per second by the time uh, that this information was collected. Uh, that means that this is providing 24 gigabytes per second bandwidth, which is significant. So just to move the petabyte of data from the storage disk to the compute nodes, it, it takes 11 hours. So my challenge of doing that in one hour is far from my current situation, if I look at that scenario. Okay? First. I would say not, maybe not the first, but uh, really first companies that realized about this and had this real problem was uh, one of them was Google for sure. So uh, basically what they decided is that there was a big issue if you were keeping data on one side of your data center and the computational power on the other one. So what was the decision? The decision, and that's influencing the big data market today, is this one. So let's move the data from that end to the compute nodes. And this is basically what, uh, uh, if you are aware about what uh, Hadoop is doing and map reviews, that's, that's the initial movement that they, they did. So basically taking the data out of there and moving it somewhere else. Okay? Uh, that, that makes some, some more challenges in terms of programmability and so on. But let, let's continue with examples. So one petabyte of data, that, that roughly today could be 100, uh, 500 disks. Okay, more or less, and they are cheap ones. So let's let's assume that we are not getting enterprise technology, but we're getting consumer technology. 
So uh, this is a rough price. So with 100, less than uh, a bit more than 500 uh, uh, terabyte uh, disk, we could we, we could get a petabyte of data. So that's not that impressive. And this is two terabyte disk. You can get eight terabyte disk today. So with way less than that, you could host it. The thing is, if we assume four four hard disks per node, okay, which is a reasonable for one U unit, that's that's reasonable. In, with 128 nodes and 500 disks, we have one petabyte of data. That's that's not that impressive architecture, right? The thing is, what happens if we look what, what, what we can get from those disks? So basically, if we assume, again, this unrealistic 100 megabytes per second uh, bandwidth per disk, that would require that with 512 disks, we're getting an average, an aggregated bandwidth of 51, more or less, gigabytes per second, which is significant uh, uh, bandwidth. Still, for reading one petabyte of data with that bandwidth, you still require almost six hours. So the challenge here is not, is not the capacity, it's, it's the IO capacity of the devices. So what we need to achieve one petabyte uh, per hour challenge? So we basically we need uh, almost 3,000 disks, not because of the capacity, but because of the bandwidth. So if you would really want to put that pressure on the IO subsystem, you need that, that bandwidth. Okay? So if we stick to the 128 nodes, uh, the challenge is that we have to pack uh, 23, nodes per, uh, 23 disks per node, which is not that easy in one view units for sure. Two so units or, well, in four units for sure you can do that. So this is basically 2.3 uh, terabits per second, the bandwidth that you want to get. So basically, we have been, for many years, having challenges in bottlenecks on this side of the data centers. <coughs> Today the challenge is in many situations this one, for big data domain. So if you are in computational intensive uh, domains, that's, that's not the case. But uh, this, this challenge is, is what we are facing in the big data domain in many, in many situations. Okay? But let's continue with examples. So this is a JBot. Okay? So everybody should be familiar with what a JBot is. This is just a bunch of these. So it's a chassis with disk and power, but no CPU, no memory, nothing of that inside. So if you place 20, uh, 46 disks in that, uh, in that disk, uh, you are basically having a, a 4.6 gigabyte per second peak per, per JBot, and that could be connected to those uh, 128 nodes. So basically you could get every two nodes connected to one JBot. So with the 128 nodes and a couple of these JBots, you would be able to, to, to make up the architecture that you need. Okay? So that's, that's because of bandwidth requirements. So what does that mean? We are, we are returning in, in big data, in many cases, we are coming back to the notion of direct attached storage. So we've been, we've been leaving that site for many years. We've been doing network attached storage. We've been doing uh, uh, storage area networks. And then for, because of this challenge, in many situations, we're going back to direct attached storage, which was with where, what we had many years ago. That requires complex software elements for managing this, but that also requires complex networking infrastructures. Okay? And that's, that's basically who's leading the path on that, on that way is, uh, is uh, today is uh, Infinibank mostly. Okay? So this is not a scenario that I'm making up at this time, saying that this is the kind of architecture that people is designing. So these are, these are commercial solutions. Okay? So this is, this is a SQL Server uh, parallel data warehouse appliance. So this is a closed appliance that in the commercial world for, for data warehousing, for, for let's say databases without really uh, joint operations between, between tables, uh, this is what Microsoft was selling. So this is a couple of racks interconnected with Infiniban, and the internal architecture is they build that from a couple of compute nodes, every two nodes connected to J, one JBot, so this is an infiniband network for doing the communication between the nodes, and the interface with the JBot is direct attached storage. So that means SaaS today. Okay. So this is this is the architecture. IBM has something similar. Oracle has something similar. So everyone in the, that domain of uh, data warehousing is moving in that in that in that very same direction. So what we are basically doing is we are changing the paradigm. So we've been looking for many years at the paradigm in which the CPU was in the middle and the data was sitting around and we were moving data from the edge to the computer and uh, we were doing the processing and then we were storing the results back. Okay? That, that's been, in many situations, that's been the paradigm. The paradigm today is data-centric models in which data is sitting in the middle and we are trying to put computation around it and as close as possible to the data because we are having challenges in terms of IO bandwidth with the devices. So uh, this is, uh, I'm taking some of the slides, I, I, I think I have credits for, for all of them. 
but I'm taking some of the slides of uh, people I know and that they have been giving talks on this also. So they, they did great work on putting together some slides, so I'm reusing them. But this is this is from Blackfish from IBM. So basically, uh, there are different categories of uh, applications today. So my, my domain, my research domain is on this on this side. So basically, embarrassingly parallel environments in which real pressure is being put on the IO subsystem. That's that's Hadoop domain, Spark domain, and, and similar thing. So I've been also working on this domain, on a streaming of data. That, that's another paradigm. Okay, in, another paradigm in the in the in the meaning that. Uh, in this case, you are not expecting to have large storage pools. Basically, what you are doing is processing data on the fly. I will show at the end of the presentation a scientific example of, of use of this for, for astronomy. Uh, then we have the, the classical domains, okay, in which we have uh, basically pattern, well-established pattern communications or, or random communications, but uh, there is a lot of network dependencies or data dependencies. So the, the, the graphs that you are building there are way more complex. So uh, that's the that's the, that's the that's the data generator models, and this is the more complex computational intensive and and and, and inter about uh, communications patterns in the in the network. Okay, so big data can, can be mapped to any of these domains. Okay, the classical commercial domain is on this side, but in HPC, in many cases, those are the, the two domains that are more uh, relevant for big. So uh, next thing I want to do is uh, now that I focus exactly what I'm what, what I think is the biggest challenge in, in many situations for big data is, is what are the common trends that technology is following for addressing that, and uh, one of the challenges uh, I one of the one of the trends that we are seeing today is scale up again. So we've been we were building a scale up supercomputers for years. Then we started clustering things. We built the scale out solutions. Now, in many domains, we are scaling up again. Okay, we have the technologies for doing that. So basically, that means memory extension in many in many cases and uh, interconnection of different of different of different nodes, creation of large SMPs. So this is this is uh, from Bull and other OEMs are, are building similar stuff. So this is what they call the super uh, super nodes. I think they call it. Uh, so I, I don't know if you are familiar with this kind of uh, very large SMPs. So they are detecting them. Uh, so this this beast, that is the biggest one, it uh, uh, basically creates a single address space for 288 cores, and it can reach a maximum capacity of memory of 24 terabytes. So I don't know the price tag for that, but I think that's not going to be cheap. Okay. Uh, there are many commercial workloads. That are running in this kind of application, so that makes much simpler the programming model for the users. So you have shared address space, and it manages all the communications at the at the hardware level. So basically, all, all the interconnects are made at the hardware level, so you don't need to explicitly exchange uh, messages between processes on, on on memory. So that's one of the ways of uh, solving some of the big data problems that we are facing today. So I, I'm, I'm mentioning 24 terabytes of RAM. So that's not a big data problem. So, so everybody is thinking about terabytes of, of uh, petabytes of memory. In practice in the market, there are many, many, many applications that are way below that. So not that many people is managing petabytes of data. But there are many, many uh, working sets that could feed on that, and that they are seeing a huge boost, basically, by, by being able to run in this kind of integrated architecture. So uh, some examples again coming from from the commercial world. So uh, I'm including this one from 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 IBM. So basically, IBM DB2 with with blue acceleration is a flavor of uh, DB2. That is the database from from IBM. But basically, this is managing through uh, um, CMD extensions in the processors. They are managing on the fly compression and descompression of very uh, uh, heavily charged of memory, one terabyte by the time of this slide. This is not that much today. But they are basically using that terabyte of RAM for compressing data and the compressing data on the fly. So basically, they can reach a uh, few terabytes of data sets in memory. So that's all in RAM. And uh, they are using all the hardware acceleration that they, they can to send the units uh, on the fly doing the compression and decompression. So they are, for many customers that are below 50 terabytes of RAM in the uh, 50 terabytes of data set, they, they can accommodate in this kind of single machine solutions. So that's, that's one of the approaches that we are seeing. They are, that's, that's, the, that's not the only one. So this is, this is a project we're running in, in, in BSC. So for instance, in the genomics domain, there is a huge opportunity for, for creating uh, new, new approaches to software in terms of genomics that can take advantage of this kind of scale-up architectures. 
So in many cases, basically running with the potential availability of terabytes of memory, whatever it is, now we will discuss it later, what memory means, RAM, flash, other things, that gives you a way to really accelerate some of the workloads that you run. And that's, that's, that's another of the technologies that is quickly evolving on, on this domain. So memory extensions for basically accommodating larger data sets in the, in, the, in the CPU, basically because the challenge you have is idle. It's not processing capacity. So uh, what are the players in this, in this domain? So examples of this. I don't know how many of you are familiar with NVMe. It's more or less. So everybody is kind of sensible to uh, flash technology here. So uh, NVMe is a standard for, for reducing the stack of uh, I.O. operations on, on flash devices, maybe. Okay? So one of the challenges that you have when, when you're accessing flash storage and uh, well, that's the same thing that we are doing with RDMA for, for networks, is when you have lots, millions, billions of operations per second, basically this stack that is implemented in the operating system for checking permissions, virtual file systems, all that thing, that's consuming so many cycles of CPU that that's the limiting factor for many applications. So you basically cannot scale based on the time that you spend running the software stack in Linux. So NVMe is a way of reducing that, but there are other approaches. So basically in NVMe, the standard what is trying is to simplify that stack to go from 27,000 cycles to one I operation to uh, one, one million I operation, sorry, to 10,000 10, cycles to do the same, the same thing. Okay? So uh, there are other solutions on that. This, this big thing is, uh, this is a solution from Sundance, but there are other ones. So this is uh, what they call the Infinity Flash. This is a flash appliance. So uh, I think all the all vendors are putting these kind of things in the market today. So this this three U box, three U, it's half a petabyte. Okay, so that that has a huge impact. Basically, because if you imagine how much power do you put in one petabyte of data today, how many racks you have to to put, how many disks you have to fit, how many servers you have to fit, basically with three U you get one of those things. So Power-wise, these kind of solutions are also making a huge impact. I think the, the main customers for this at the beginning were, were the big uh, internet players, uh, Dropbox, Facebook, and, and company. But uh, uh, this is commercial solutions today, so everybody is putting that kind of things in the market. <coughs> there are other alternative solutions. So this comes from, from IBM. I don't know how many people is familiar with the CAP interface from IBM. Not that many people that. So a uh, CAP interface is an interface that Power8 and Beyond inter implements in, in, the, in the processor, basically for creating a coherent view between the processor and an FPGA. So basically, you run a small piece of, uh, uh, of uh, RTL that they, they deliver to you in the FPGA. You plug the FPGA in the PCIe bus, and basically, it becomes first-class citizen in the system. Okay, so first class citizen means here that it has coherent access to the main memory of the system. So it can get communicated with the processor through memory. Why they are using that in the domain of big data? So for memory extension. So basically you can, you can get uh, one of these flash systems. That's a flash array again, but what I was showing from, from, from Sandis before. And uh, through this uh, FPGA you manage the I operations with the flash subsystem. So basically you can run in a server that is basically through FPGA making the page, the page replace. So virtually what you have is a system that has 40 terabytes of memory, wherever it is. It is lower than RAM, but this is faster than this. So that's, that's, that's uh, pretty usable for many things. They are reducing the IO stack, but more importantly, there are some applications that are already taking advantage of that. So uh, I don't know if you are familiar with Redis, which is a key value store. That is used in many in many domains, not just in commercial domains. So they have an implementation based on this and based on other extensions now. That is basically uh, leveraging this this kind of uh, technology to really accelerate and really boost the, the workloads that they are that they are running. So that's that's another common approach. So we were doing an estimation on, on BSC. Basically, we we have. Uh, we have uh, that uh, thousand genomes that we are storing, so that's 1.5 petabytes. So uh, with the application that I was showing before, we were checking how fast we could process that data based on different architectures, IO subsystems, etc. So uh, if basically we would like to have all that data stored in memory, okay, we, we would need basically 11,000 of our current nodes. So that's a lot, we don't have that many. But uh, technically, with this kind of architecture, with 30, 38 servers, we could host the same data at the speed that you would get from that. 
So basically, because of scaling up individual servers, you get significant advantages in terms of bandwidth with the data and processing capabilities. Of course, you don't get a shared, you don't get a shared file system with that. You should do that in software, but you have many opportunities for, for taking advantage of the additional bandwidth and, and capacity for storage that you get with that. So other things, uh, this is... This is another IBM project. Uh, so uh, there are other efforts on the idea of, uh, of uh, flash uh, acceleration. So uh, I was mentioning before uh, NVMe. So NVMe still has, still has a relevant, uh, significant uh, IO stack that needs to be covered by the processor. So this project basically what it's trying to do is using RDMA verbs from Infiniman, well, from Ofet, in fact, to access flash storage devices. So basically what you are doing is well, the same thing that you are doing today when you are writing applications that are using RDMA verbs for communicating across nodes without intervention of the CPU. You would do that but for talking to the flash device that is attached to your node. So that's, that's offloading some of, the, some of the difficulties on getting access to the data. So there are se several efforts on this, on this line. So in general, the, the, what we expect to see in the future in this, in this area is basically having different types of memory. So we are used to see RAM and storage, this storage, so we are starting to see storage plus memory, so today it's, it's all flash in this, in this domain, basically, well, there are some other things, but uh, the idea is that we will start seeing other kinds, or we already see some systems, some other kinds of uh, intermediate memory technologies, basically to alleviate one, some of the problems that we are facing in this, in this domain. So what's the, other, what's the other approach? So scale-up solves some of the problems, but still for some data intensive uh, applications, you still need to scale out because you have that need. So uh, what, what we've seen in this, in, this, uh, in this domain, so basically what we're starting seeing is how to create storage plus compute pools of, uh, uh, of, uh, of storage capacity for, for interconnecting to, to servers. So I think this is, a, this is a good example. So this is a project I was working on well, in, in, for a couple of years. So this is, a, this is an extension of BlueGene. So this is kind of an experimental project. There are a couple of deployments of this machine. But uh, this is kind of experimental. It was basically taking the BlueGene architecture, taking the IO blowers that you have in, uh, in BlueGene, and putting inside flash devices. And basically replacing some of the compute nodes in the supercomputer, basically with those uh, IO blowers with flash storage inside. So basically what you were providing is a lot of IO capability and a lot of storage capacity directly attached to the compute nodes. So that basically was turning this uh, supercomputer into a big uh, storage box with embedded computing capability. So basically you have there few terabytes of data and when you say give me that data but filter in this way, that data is already filtered inside of the storage box. So when it comes out, what you pull out from the compute nodes outside of this uh, of this kind of architectures, is there already is is data that has been already filtered, digested, and processed. So that's that's one of the things. So you embed all the IO capacity inside of a closed box, and you don't need to have interconnection, very fast interconnection network with the outside world, or not that fast interconnection networks. So that, that's that's basically the prototype. That's the IO rovers, and those were the flash devices that were connected inside, and that's uh, those, those were the IO. Uh, the, the, the connections with the compute nodes that were in that in that box. So why we use that? So basically, we use that to give an example for genomics workflows. So this is this is a classical workflow in genomics in, in sequence alignment. So in sequence alignment, one of the things that those of you are, that are familiar with this. So basically, you start with your with your sequencing machine that is producing lots of raw data. So basically, that data goes through alignment stages, then you have to do some post-processing on that. If you are familiar with this, you know that in many cases this is done just as a bunch of scripts that are run one after another. And basically what you keep doing is every time that you do one step, from one step to the next one, what you do is you write the data to disk, you read the data to disk again. So if you think about the classical supercomputing architecture in which you have uh, storage area network or uh, network attached to whatever you prefer. In fact, what you have to do is you put a lot of pressure on the IO subsystem with the file system. So what we were leveraging here is the idea of uh, basically doing all this processing as primitives that could happen inside of the embedded uh, storage. So that, that box that I was telling you before. So instead of going from this step to this step by writing data to disk and reading data to disk, that was changed. And what we were doing was we were replacing all the operations that you had to do by operations through a key value store that was actually storing the data in flash technologies. So basically, instead of <coughs> computing things in memory and then dumping them to disk and then reading again on the next thing, 
And the next step of the pipeline, what we were doing is we were replacing the memory access operations by key value or store access uh, operations. So basically, instead of changing the value in an array, you were inserting or updating a position in a key value store. And that key value store was living in in the storage devices that you had close to the computation part forever. So the next step in the pipeline was not really reading from data uh, from disk again. What was doing is basically attaching to the key value store that you had in memory. So basically, instead of dumping data, reading data, you basically keep the data in a place, you attach to it, transform it, detach, next process attaches to it, trust it, transfers it, and that's, that's the way. So data didn't move from, from, from the key value store. So this is this is uh, just an example. I will not I will not go through it because I will not have the time to do that. But basically, this is just to show that uh, it's quite simple in many uh, in many workloads uh, to replace basically uh, memory accesses, array accesses by other things that could be uh, key value store insertions and other things that are already designed for hosting these these amounts of data. And this is this is another example. So. Uh, this is another example that is, I think, interesting, and uh, this is based on some of the, that, those classical predictions that you see uh, uh, out there that uh, people is doing. So, uh, what's going to happen in in terms of uh, mid time between interruptions in new uh, in new generation supercomputers at the scale of exascale? So, people is expecting to see a lot of snapshotting. So, when you have very large machines, failures will affect you for sure every time more. And what they are uh, predicting to happen is that you will see much more snapshotting. So one of the big data challenges that you may have in a supercomputer in the future is basically how much data can you store in terms of snapshotting. You cannot keep doing that every second, or maybe if you do that, you will basically collapse the file systems because of that. So you have to guess new ways of doing, of doing that kind of thing. So this is not the classical application that one would think about when you mention big data, but that's in some large infrastructures, that's a real problem if you are uh, running things like the MPI, MPI that are not that far, that easy to recover when they when they uh, break the, the when they have issues with the with the infrastructure in which they are running. So uh, I, I think that that that's a quick uh, summary of what uh, I was mentioning. So uh, I, I saw I shown before that this transition was happening, going from computation and storage separated to integrate computation and storage in one side and get uh, and get that thing embedded. Uh, that, that drives us to the share nothing architecture that we have today. So basically we want to disconnect, uh, we want to get storage and computation together, but then we, not, we need to have global access to all that uh, storage. So basically those are the share nothing architectures that we have today, in which if this guy needs to get access that is sitting here, needs to speak a protocol to this other node to request that that data should be sent to it. So that's not the notion of general distributed file system, but this is share nothing architectures that in, in the end can offer the same infrastructure or the same interfaces to the end user, but the challenges behind are, are slightly different, okay? And uh, this transition from, from Rotation of these two flash devices is, is already a reality, so I think no one has questions about about that. Okay, and fast interconnection networks, fast network fabrics is a critical. If you imagine this kind of domain, a lot of communication is happening in this in in this uh, internode uh, process. So uh, the other trend that is happening in this domain of big data is the specialization. Okay, that's happening in all domains, but uh, it has particular applications here. So examples of that. This is something, this is not a great success in the market, but I think that's a great initiative from the point of view of uh, technology. This is uh, IBM's Nitinza. So uh, that was a technology in which basically they were embedding a lot of FPGAs uh, in racks. So the idea is that uh, when you wanted to do, uh, similar to what I was saying before, you want to get uh, data out from some of the servers of your machine and you want to get it transformed. So the data was connected to FPGA. So basically the data that was pushed, pulled out from drives from this drive was basically transformed in the FPGAs to the initial step of transformation, joining and, and filtering and that kind of things you do in databases in many cases, just to produce data that is already reduced in size at that initial step. 
So that's something that people have been doing. So that's, that's the notion. They had specialized nodes with uh, FPGAs and they had general purpose nodes. They interconnected them and the data could be basically shaped in different ways of reduce, transform, uh, uh, rearrange, joint uh, on the fly through the FPGAs before they were making it to the compute nodes in which they had to do something useful with it. Okay? So that's an that's, that's appliance type solution. Then there's another big initiative in this, in this domain that is a Catapult project. So I don't know how many people know the project from, from Microsoft. That's, that's in commercial production. So that was a research project initially, but that's a commercial solution that if you're using Bing, you're using it today. So basically, uh, what they started doing, they announced that in 2014, but I think they started in 2009. So what they have done basically is they have taken Azure, which is the cloud solution from, from Microsoft, and they have this Bing index, so it's competing in some way with Google search, right? And uh, basically, they need to process, they, do, they need to do all the same things that you do uh, for, for doing search engines. So they have to crawl all the data from the web, they have to correlate that information, they have to build the reverse indexes to be able to do queries on that indexes later. So uh, the idea of this, uh, of this Catapult project is why don't we do that in FPGAs? So they deployed, uh, I don't know exactly what number of uh, FPGAs, but many of them, on, on Bing and they were, um, on Azure, sorry, and they were attaching those FPGA cards in the different nodes. And they were talking about basically the data plane that was the, the plane at which FPGAs were interconnected. So they were all interconnected with switching networks. And uh, basically they had the, the compute nodes on top of that. So you had the compute nodes and they had the network of FPGAs. So why did they use that for? So uh, when you do that kind of, uh, of index, one of the things that you have to do is do some steps that are related to feature extraction and processing. So you need to process that that text for every single web page that you have in the world or every single document, you have to go through that text and uh, basically extract what are the features, the words, how they are connected, and build that information that is needed to do the indexing. Okay? So that those steps that are very computer intensive, very repetitive, and very I/O intensive, they were externalized to the FPGA network. So basically what they did is that from the whole pipeline, pipeline that they had to do, all these steps were externalized to a FPGA, that was the feature extraction path. And that was composed, that was integrated into the, into the pods that they have in, in the Bing infrastructure. So basically you have the racks, the, all the infrastructure that you would see in a normal data center, but they had attached to that, they had a second overlay of network fabric that was interconnecting all the FPGAs. So data was driven, so the, 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 let's say the control plane in some way was the servers, and the data plane that was doing actual computation on that data was the FPGA plane that was called the data plane in this, in this approach. Uh, so that's, that's the topology that they were following for, for interconnecting all the, all the FPGAs across them. <coughs> so that's a single box that they were building. So the cluster, this is, this is part of the Open Compute project. So that's one of the architectures. And that small thing on there is the FPGA in which they were doing that computation. So that has I think it's. Uh, I think I have a slide for that. Yeah, I think I, I, it has. Uh, in the final version, they have a, a, a SFP plus uh, interfaces on those cards, and they, that's what they use for for interconnecting all of them through 10 gig uh, uh, links, basically. And that's the, the data plane I was mentioning before. And this this is not the final version. So what they were reporting about that was basically that with that infrastructure, they had that. They doubled the performance of the system, the throughput. They reduced significantly the latency, but uh, they, more importantly, they reduced the power, and they had no power, fa uh, no hardware failures uh, on, on the first uh, phases of the test. So that was a significant, a significant impact for them. So this was a very uh, high-intensive workload that they keep running continuously. So a specialization was was very useful for them. And then you see that there are other approaches like that. So that's that's not the only one. But uh, Intel, for instance, is already putting on the market these this solutions in which they are embedding Xeon processors with, uh, with uh, FPGAs, basically because uh, you have a specialization here, but one of the advantages is that you have a normal bandwidth between these two guys with the memory, and uh, then you have also the, the PCIe interfaces. So, so this, this FPGA can really uh, be successful for, for some uh, very high intensive uh, workloads, and that's, that's something we are, we are already Exploring. So, uh, do I have some more minutes? Yeah, I have some time, right? More or less? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Five minutes more. Okay, so no, I'm, I'm in the final in the final stages. So uh, just just a few more comments before closing. So uh, I don't know how many of you. It, it's it's kind of a trend uh, here. People in the HPC domain talking about uh, NoSQL and how to start using NoSQL systems for storing data in, in HPC. So uh, I don't know if any of you are looking at those things, but this is there, there's that big promise. Of, uh, so we change the cap theorem, so we, 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 we remove some of the constraints. We are not that interested in, in transactional properties like banks, maybe. And we gain scale-out solutions, perfect scalability, and many other magic things that they, they tell you. So I, I think that's a, that's, that's a very nice example of what I mean. So this is a comparison in which uh, this is comparison, it's comparing latency and this is IOPS. So uh, I've been using for several years Couchbase. In my in my research, so so they, they you, you can end up seeing this kind of chart in which they promise you almost zero latency for storing any kind of data for any kind of pressure that you can put on the backend. So you could keep it growing, and uh, it would be so so low as that. The thing is that these these things are, are always in some way false approaches to the to the reality. So uh, what what most of these systems do is they have an initial replication layer that is memory to memory. So basically, when you store data in one of these uh, clusters of NoSQL no servers, first thing that, they, that you do is basically you write in one of them, and they, they evenly distribute the load between them. First thing they do is they, they replicate that to other servers, basically for, for uh, security or for resilience reasons. So if you lose that node in which you wrote data, you should have copies of that. So when you have done the, when you have done the, the in-memory writing and the network sending, the operation is considered finished. Okay, but that's not persisted anyway, so that's, uh, they, that needs to happen. So uh, what they do is they rely heavily on memory. So basically, if you are putting this pressure for 10 minutes on your stop, you will get this latency. If you persist that forever, there's, there's going to be a point at which you will be able to write data, as usually, at the maximum speed of the IO devices that you have under it. Okay? So that's, that's something that, that usually requires some, some more time of evaluation than what they usually look at but you end up hitting that limit. Or maybe you have to put a lot of IO uh, devices uh, behind that to, to be able to handle all the, all the IO pressure that you will end up, end up when you exhaust all the memory that you have in these systems, okay? And uh, I will skip this final part. Yeah, sounds interesting. I'm sorry about my well, but... Okay, so I, I will skip the final part. So uh, just, uh, I wanted to, to discuss some of these things, but uh, I don't have that time. So, uh, just a final, a final reminder. So I think this is this is an interesting thing to discuss. So I told you before I, I don't really come from the HPC world that much. So I've been exposed to this and I've been working in relation to it, but my my expertise is in a different domain. So I think something that is relevant is to look at what are the similitudes today between similarities for today between uh, the supercomputing and the HPC world and the commercial world. And they are converging, and I think that that everybody should be aware of that. So uh, I think that it's important to start looking at what's happening in the commercial world because so many of the technologies that the HPC world is adopting come from that world, and there are many examples of that. So um, I still remember many years ago people was uh, laughing on, on people using uh, Java or Python or Perl on, on on HPC environments, and today. Mm, more or less everyone has examples of applications that run in that domain. Uh, and and that, that's, that's pretty much the same for, for almost any domain of the technology. So I, I did the exercise of going through all of them and seeing what are the similitudes, and the convergence is clear. But there's a lot to be learned from both sides. So uh, commercial world is looking at the HPC world. I was talking about uh, uh, data warehousing uh, architectures that were using uh, Infiniban and verbs for, for, for interconnecting nodes that comes clearly from the HPC background, but that's, that's also true the other way around. So uh, that would be a recommendation. Everybody should have a look at what's out there in the commercial world and see what are the, uh, in terms of big data, what are the, the influences that they can get for the, for the HPC domain. I'm sorry if I was a bit too thank long. You, thank you for this interesting talk.